Welcome to another episode of Suddenly Soundtrack, the show here on Take 3 Productions where we go through a movie musical, song by song, and judge a movie solely based on the soundtrack that it provides. Here we are going through 1996's Disney classic, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I am joined here by, you know him from the movie trivia spoon on as the question writer. He's a very good friend of mine, Chris Skaliski. Chris, what's when's the first time you saw this movie? Why do you like it so much? And tell me a bit about why you love The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh, gosh. I probably I saw this in theaters. <laughs> I guarantee it. I always saw or I still always see those the Disney movies, you know, right away as they come out. Um so it would have been 96 sometime going to the theater to see, to see it. Um, and I, I like it because it's, I don't know, it's just a good movie that a lot of people kind of slough off. It's like, oh, that, it's Hunchback. It's, you know, it's it's not Aladdin. It's not Lion King. It, it, no, it's not. But it, it's still a, a really good film, um, good songs, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and just kind of a different and so a little bit darker story and and film that they, than they usually do. So that kind of just makes it stand out a little bit too. A hundred and ten percent, Chris. Actually, this is my favorite Disney movie of all time. My favorite Disney musical of all time, and one of my five favorite musicals ever made. The Hunchback of Notre Dame is very underrated, and many parents back in the day, when I was only five years old in '96, didn't really understand it. They kind of felt like it, it's like the Batman Returns of, <laughs> of of Disney films. Like many parents were like, this is too dark. There's literally a song in this film kind of suggesting rape. It, it really does. And we're going to get into it. And it's one of the best Disney villain songs ever. But let's get right into this soundtrack, Chris, with what I consider to be the greatest Disney song ever ever written, ever made, the opening number, The Bells of Notre Dame. To the big bells as loud as the thunder, to the little bells soft as a psalm, and some say the soul of the city is the toll of the bell. The bells of Notre Dame. This song it, it introduces you to the motif of the film, which is basically the no, the big power power notes with the the Greek chorus, the the giant chorus, and and it it settles you into the musical aesthetic of this film that is essentially church. It's a very it's very church. It's very organ heavy. It's very gothic. The music is very gothic. Chris, what are your thoughts on the opening number, Bells of Notre Dame? Well, that's one thing I, I like about it because I'm Catholic and I've you know grown up going to kind of a cathedral type church and so like this kind of look the music type kind of really spoke to me you know I'm familiar with it um, things I've grown up with but I, I I agree I love the bells of Notre Dame the way it just uh, has that kind of power opening just kind of big and boisterous um, with the choir the chorus you know the choral aspect of it and then you get into you know the the Clopon's like narration slash, you know, kind of giving you the history, the backstory and telling you what you're in for. And then of course, uh, was it Paul, Paul Candle that, that does the voice in the singing? He's just incredible. Um, I, I, I agree. I, this, this is one of my favorite Disney songs as well. And it's a heck of a way to, to open a film. 110% Chris, this is easily 
easily, easily a rockin'. What are your thoughts? Oh, this is the easiest choice of the whole list. I think it, it's rockin'. It's 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 rockin' times ten. It's awesome. Like even when was uh, David uh, Ogden Stiers comes in as archdeacon and he talks about you know you can't never run from the what you've done with the eyes of Notre Dame and they all like you see like the statues like they're looking at Frollo and then at the end that that last was a high D note that that he hits um, sing the bells of Notre Dame I love I love the whole song but that last bit is my favorite is so good it's so i love it I, I can i'll just listen to that little like 10 to 15 second clip over and over because it's 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 pretty incredible what he can do but yeah this is definitely a rockin then we get into out there and out there living in the sun it, you know, it has that kind of dark beginning with Frollo just telling Quasimodo that he's worthless and not worth anything, and Quasimodo kind of agreeing with him. Um, but then it, it it bursts into that kind of hopeful, you know, one day I'm going to be out there amongst everyone. Um, you know, it's a great song. You kind of get you get to know Quasimodo a little bit more. You get to know kind of the re- see the relationship between him and Frollo, what it's going to be like. Um, but uh, you know, it's I, I I like it quite a bit. Um, not quite as much as you know the opening song, but um, it's still a very strong song to kind of get you into the film. This is kind of like what you usually get in some of these this, these Disney Renaissance films that you get that song about somebody longing to be somewhere where they're not. Man, the set pieces and the animation are fantastic, and the singing is commendable. I have to give this a rock. And Chris, what do you give it? Um, I give it a download. Oh, really? Um, Yes, I mean I still like it, but it's it's not. I don't know for, for whatever reason for me it's it's not up there with some other maybe Disney songs where I would just be like yes absolutely rocking. But um, I do enjoy it uh, quite a bit, and you know it's a good way to set up the characters. But I, I do give it a download. Yeah, I can see that that criticism because yes, it is very formulaic. It is a kind of standard tip of, tip of the mill Disney song, and it, it might not be everybody's cup of tea. Speaking of not everybody's cup of tea, this one kind of isn't mine. It's called Topsy Turvy. Once a year we throw a party here in town. Once a year we turn all parties upside down. Topsy Turvy is just kind of one of the, the kind of sillier songs. I guess you and Disney puts it kind of a maybe a goofier song, but it, it, tell, it shows you the, you know, the, the festival. Quasimodo's out amongst, you know, all the, all the people. He's trying to, uh, just kind of hide and watch, but call on and, and kind of keeps pulling him in it. Um, and he gets kind of, you know, falls around, falls into people and kind of a, kind of a goofy scene, but I like the song. Um, I think it, it just kind of sets up the, 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 I guess the fun side of, if you can call it fun side of, of the film, even though it is kind of a darker film. Um, it just has the kind of rousing, um, here, you know, this is this one's for the kids to kind of have for them to have fun um, and set up what's going to happen later with with Quasimodo. Yeah. Over the course of this song, you are introduced to Esmeralda and yep. and then Quasimodo seeing Esmeralda for the first time. Not when you but it's importance in the movie kind of detracts to me from the actual song itself. I think the song itself is kind of bland compared to some of the more church gothic as- aspects mm-hmm. of the rest of the soundtrack and it kind of doesn't gel a later song we're going to talk to court of miracles i think does this song better with a better instrumentation even though that court of miracles is a completely different song it still has the same p- spunk and personality as this song except it's right, more right. menacing this song just to me doesn't feel like it, it, it kind of fits compared to the rest of the soundtrack, and I have to give it a one-time listen. I don't dig it. I've never dug it. It's probably my least favorite part of the actual movie itself. So the song itself just kind of fell flat for me. And it's To me, it's a one-time listen. Chris, what do you give it? Um, I, actually, I like it a little bit more than you. I, mm-hmm. I'll give it a download. Um, I think it's fun. I Pretty much any song that, that Coppin is singing in, like I like. So... Uh, just because that guy's got a great voice and it's uh, is a uh, fun, um, but no, I, I give it a download. Okay, yeah, Clavin is the best singer hands down on the on the soundtrack. Oh, yeah, he absolutely. his voice, his tenor is amazing. It's just that it's not put to good use in my opinion for this song. But opinions do differ. 
Then we get into, okay, so as I said, we were introduced to Esmeralda. And, and this, this film does deal a lot with racism and subjectivity. And I feel like God Help the Outcasts, the single most, I would say, popular song from this soundtrack, objectively speaking, God Help the Outcasts, um, is popular for a reason. God help the outcasts hungry from birth. Show them the mercy they don't find on earth. And um, this song is beautiful. I feel like the scene might go on a little too long in the movie, but the song itself is beautiful and i actually wish they extended it like the bet midler song we're going to get into later um chris what are your thoughts on god help the outcasts this one's an interesting one because when yeah. i was younger um this you know this is kind of the slow part of the movie yeah, it's same. quieter and so like i was kind of like all right get on with it like, you know, like get get through the song get to the action get to the fun peppy songs but as i've gotten older and, and listened to it even more recently like i i like this song a lot um, you talk about the not only like the message that it gives, um, where Esmeralda's help the outcast. You know, I don't ask for anything else. I don't ask for fame, money, um, just and you know, you know I, I'm I'm blessed as an individual, but help my people. Like the message and, and musically, it's it's a great song as well. Um, so I've I've come around on it like a 180 where I really do I like this song a lot. Yes, when you're a kid, the the whole the whole slow song stuff doesn't really sit into you like in beauty and the beast the mrs potts beauty and the beast song i felt dragged on and on and on just because it was slow and you didn't take time to actually s sit back and see oh this is what this song means and god help the Out outcast does that to a 10th degree and there's a reason why this is this was the hit single off of the off of the soundtrack and why to this day it's still one of the most popular songs from it I give God Help the Outcast an easy rockin'. It was fantastic, and Esmeralda killed it, and the sequence is beautifully animated for 1996. Uh, Chris, what do you give it? I also give it a rockin'. I think, was it was her name Heidi, Heidi uh, Mollenhauer? I yeah. Think, is who sings it, you know, and it feels like it's actually, you know, Esmeralda singing it, and not, you know, some someone else who doesn't really fit the character, but... Um, you know, it fits the fits the character, fits the the, the film at the time, and uh, I do, like I said, give it a rockin'. Of course, and I feel like this song, like, I think it epitomizes the whole point of the movie is subjectivity and what people view you as and how you you want to kind of, it's a good uh, bookend to out there because it's the moral of the movie. And if you have a song in your musical that demonstrates that it does it and it does it successfully, you have a perfect song that, that marries to your soundtrack to the 10th degree. Then we get into what has over time become the most, or one of the most popular Disney villain songs ever. Uh, it's the heaven's light hell fire sequence that it starts pretty and beautiful no face as hideous as my face was ever meant for heaven's light and then it turns into this dark vengeful song sung by the great tony j like fire What are your thoughts on this sequence? <laughs> um, this is great. Like it starts out, you know, heaven's light. It kind of moves through that pretty quickly. Um, so you got two kind of two sides of the coin there. But when it comes into Hellfire, you're right. It's I feel like it's it's either one of the more popular Disney villain songs, or it's one that everybody is aware of just because of what it's yep. about. Um, but yeah, Tony J. He he crushes it in that in that song, and it's it's just such a dark, different song for Disney, and and really. Uh, hits you over the, not hits you over the head but just kind of um puts it out there that this is what you know this villain is dealing with and this is you know where we're going with this story as far as kind of his lust for esmeralda and his kind of own trying to put blame on her for his feelings which is gross it's a, um, it's a deep it, concept for a children's movie yes <laughs> very i mean so like and then you have like the the fiery you know silhouette of her and then like the uh 
judge demon looking like hooded uh you know people that pop up in the robes on the side and it's it's you know very dark and sinister but it's it's one of my favorite songs of the film yeah and look the subject of of this th- this is probably why most parents were upset with the film because <laughs> in some households hell is considered a bad word and to have right. your kid repeat that over and over again after seeing a Disney movie is probably not the best for a parent. But, you know, this is this also many people don't take note of this, but the the Hellfire theme, the motif of the Hellfire is the motif from the opening number just in a minor key. Instead of going, boom, ah, boom, ah, it's Hellfire, Dark Fire. People know I, I, I actually recognize that late late into late into my life and i feel like this movie using your motifs that subtly kind of boosts it up for me even more from a music standpoint chris what do you give it uh i give it a rockin mm-hmm. it, it's a it's a it's a pretty easy rockin for me it's it's a great not only a great villain song but just a great song altogether. so it is a rockin yeah to me also it's a rockin heaven's light is a great little prelude to it there's nothing mm-hmm. really about heaven's light it's just a soft little little prelude by quasimodo it's beautiful but the meat of the song is where it really really shines right. yep agreed then we get into a song that is probably my least favorite and for good reason um a lot, a lot of what people have a problem with in this film, and I don't know if you do, Chris, but with me as well, are the gargoyles and the fact that they're kind of a bit too obnoxious sometimes. And I think Nostalgia Critic was the one that actually brought to my attention that maybe they should have been like allusions to him, like in in his oh, mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I feel like the the ending kind of ruins that whole fallacy. Um, and oh, right. a, a guy like you sung by Jason Alexander is probably the lowest point of the film in my opinion. A guy like you, she's never known kid. Um, it, the song itself doesn't grab me. The, the, the vocals are, are kind of too comedic and don't fit the rest of the motifs in the film. Mm-hmm. Chris, do you agree with me or not? I, I agree. I, I mean, it's fine. It's the the kind of the comic, comedic relief singing the the kids the characters that were created for like the younger kids that are singing. It's that song that in musicals it usually it doesn't really feel like it fits with the rest of the movie, but it's there and it's just in a weird spot because Frollo is just like finished announcing he's going to burn all of Paris looking for Esmeralda, and then we have this kind of goofy, funny song. And it's like I get they're trying to cheer up Quasimodo, but I mean the song's fine, but you know it doesn't really do anything for me. It's like oh, okay, it's a silly song that's you know has the gargoyles have more to do, but that's that's about it. Yeah, I feel like this is was a studio head saying, okay, this movie's getting really dark. Put in something for the kids that will lighten up the mood a little bit, and I can see that point of view from a studio perspective. But when you're looking at it objectively as an adult. It just comes off as it was shoehorned in, and it, it was not necessary. And the whole sequence itself is a waste of my time to me. I <laughs> yeah, I, I skip this one entirely. Skip it, uh, Chris. What do you give it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I give it just a one-time listen. Just like, hey, I've listened to it. It's there. You know, it's it's fine. It's not. I don't think it's awful, but it it just it didn't really fit the film. But I just say give it a one time listen. Yeah, to me it's just it doesn't stack up to the quality that we've had previously. And when it does that, it kind of gets into the skip it territory. It was almost a one time listen for me, but you know I had to pull I had to pull the trigger. Yep, I hear you. Now I alluded to this when we were talking about Topsy Turvy. We were reintroduced to Clopin and his his gang. In the Court of Miracles. Maybe you've heard of a terrible place where the scoundrels of Paris collect in the air. Maybe you've heard of that mythical place called the Court of Miracles. Hello, you're there. So, essentially, in the film at this point, since this is a show about soundtracks, Chris, we're not going through the entire film. We're going through where the songs are in just a light kind of, and you as an audience, we're just going through it as a light brush of the plot. You need to watch the movie if you want the full, full context. But here, they're on the run from Frollo and everybody because they're outlaws. And uh, 
Esmeralda, um, Phil, and um, is his name Phil? Phoebus. Phoebus. Why did I say Phil? I'm thinking of Danny DeVito's Her- character from Hercules. Hercules. Yes. Esmeralda, Phoebus, and Quasimodo are in the sewers on the run from Frollo and Law. And they run into the Court of Miracles through the song Court of Miracles, which is a superior version, in my opinion, to the other song that Claude Penn and his gang sing called Topsy Turvy that we were just discussing. Chris, Court of Miracles, do you think, I know this is a very short song. What do you think of mm-hmm. Court of Miracles and how it, it's musically laid out? Oh, I like it. I like it. Uh, it's one of my, it's um, one of my favorites of the, you know, it's, it's short, it's sweet, but it, it is one of my favorites of the soundtrack. Um, you kind of get the, the more sinister side of, of like Coppin's character because he's, you know, he's fun and joy, jovial, but then he's also kind of, he's also the one that led Quasimodo up to the, to the center of like during topsy turvy and, kind of put him on the, the stage and like here they're going to hang him they're going to kill phoebus and quasimodo even though you know they helped him earlier um so you kind of get this other side of of his character as well but the, the music I love, I love the song it's you know like i said it's short and sweet but it's it's a it's a quality song in the soundtrack it's it's short and it's, it's quality the only downside to me is it's too short i feel like this yeah. song compared to other songs needed like an extra verse an extra kind of couple bars it kind of mm-hmm. needed something more extra and i feel like it's good for what it is but i just wanted more and yes it's good to leave your audience wanting more but when it's a song that needs it just to kind of s- stand up on its two legs in the score that's so epic it kind of a little bit supersedes to the weight of the rest of the score and while i love it and i and i think it's a great song and it's better than uh topsy turvy i'm gonna get a download um it's not a rocking for me it's it's a good song but it just needed to be longer and it's not quite up there for my rocking standards chris what do you give it uh, i agree i had it uh, at download um mm-hmm. just just below rocking because I, I do like the character um, the, the song, but as you said, it, I wish it was a little bit longer because they, they, they captured, they bring them in and they sing, and then he has like the little back and forth of, of whether they're going to kill him or not. Um, but yeah, I wish it was a little bit longer, but still a very good song. Anything that Clopin sings is, is it automatically gets high, high scores, but you know, yes. um, after that, there's kind of like a huge song dead zone before the finale because basically after this they get captured and there's this whole ending finale sequence with the belt, the, the the Tower of Notre Dame and the death of Frollo. So after all of that is settled and Esmeralda is rescued by Quasimodo, Phoebus and Esmeralda get married and it's a happy ending like any Disney standard. Now there's a difference before we get into this last song that in the actual book, in the actual 1939 Hunchback of Notre Dame film starring Charles Lawton, Quasimodo dies. Esmeralda dies. The, the ending, Phoebus dies very early on in the book, too. Phoebus doesn't have this huge part like he does in the Disney film. And you know what? I think Disney kind of... They Disneyfied this, the, the book. They Disneyfied the original... Mm-hmm. A story, but I think they did it with taste because overall, this entire movie has a message of inclusion. And Mm -hmm. the book didn't. The book, its ending more was if you're different, you die. Because it's a very bleak ending. And, and this kind of gives you a better moral to stick with and teach your kids. So I really don't see the problem that parents right. were having. And it, it's kind of an oxymoron <laughs> to me. Though we do get into the finale, which is a reprise of The Bells of Notre Dame, where Claude Penn basically gives you a, a, a um, epilogue. Here is a riddle to guess if you can sing the bells of Notre Dame. What makes a monster and what makes a man? And then he gives you that high note that you liked at the beginning once again and a little bit longer at the end. And it just bookends everything real well because that main uh, Bells of Notre Dame motif has been prevalent throughout the entire film and it is perfection. Chris, what do you think of ending on a reprise? Oh, yeah, I love it because I love that first song so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm just give, give me more. Give me 
all the you know bells of Notre Dame. Like you know, I'll, I'll gladly listen to to the reprise over and over. Um, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump to my rating if that's okay, because it's such a great little reprise. Mm-hmm. But um, um, give it a rockin'. Rocking that thing to the end of time. It's so rocking to me as well that we would be repeating ourselves because it's basically the same song as the first part, but it closes it off beautifully mm-hmm. and it's what you need. All right. So then we get into these two tracks, which are actually at the end credit of Hunchback of Notre Dame. These aren't in the actual film itself, but they're on the soundtrack and play during the credits. We get into someday. Someday, life will be fairer. We will be rare, and green will not bear. Which was written originally as what was going to be "God Help the Outcast." It was in that scene, but they took it out and put in "God Help the Outcasts." And then someday was recorded by a band called All for One, a band I've never heard of. That was probably <laughs> big back when this was out and disappeared. I remember them. I remember. Okay. <laughs> I remember the name of the band. Yep. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, Chris, what are your strong feelings about Someday? <laughs> um, it's a fine song, and whether this is fair or not with Disney songs, um, a lot of the ones that are during the credits or they're kind of the pop version of a song, whether it's a the another rendition of a song in the film or just exclusively the credits, I – I'll maybe you – know, if I'm actually listening to the soundtrack all the way through, I will. Someday um, – you know, listening through the soundtrack again, kind of getting ready for this and prepping. Um, you know, I thought it's it's a fine song, but mm-hmm. um, I you know I would just give it a a one timer. Um, it's you know, just because it's it's not something not ones I um, visit too often. Whether that that may not be fair to the song or not, but it's a decent song. But I, I would just give it a one time. Yeah, same. I'm giving it a one time listen, but I would actually bump it up to a download if I could hear. Th- the woman who plays Esmeralda sing it. Cause I feel like having that version of her singing this might bump it up a little bit because this is very Popeyes. Each of these, uh-huh. these young men have a verse and it sounds like a Backstreet Boys wannabe song <laughs> where the song is supposed to be like the equivalent of God help the outcasts in the movie. And it's not gelling with me, not whatsoever. And it takes me completely out of the song. And I, I feel like this was so forced. This was so forced. They could have put these boys on anything else in this soundtrack, and it still would have sounded forced. But I think they kind of took their chances on a song they cut from the film. And the song itself doesn't really mesh with what they're they're singing. These, these, these boys do not have the character in their voice to sing what these lyrics are singing, if that makes sense, Chris. So, yeah. to me, it doesn't get a one-time listen. It gets... Uh, you know what I'm, I'm i skip this this okay. i want to hear That's... i actually want to hear esmeralda sing this song not them so yeah. i like that yeah i like that I, yeah it would be nice to it would be nice to hear this um sung by the same yeah. the same artist who sang that but no it that's might a good it might help it might yeah. help you yeah. it might help a lot if, if yeah. that happened but going into something uh, completely different, and it's actually, I usually don't like it when you get the celebrity big voices to sing like the big hits from the film. This one is an exception. This and Elton John, when he sang the songs from Lion King, mm-hmm. that helped Elton because Elton wrote those songs and with Bernie. So, I mean, it, 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 it kind of helped him in that case. And it made sense for him to sing like, Can You Feel the Love Tonight in the Circle of Life? Here, I wouldn't have thought that Bette Midler, Bette Midler singing God Help the Outcast would actually be so good. I actually like how they kind of replace some of the lyrics to make it a little bit more not film-centric. I don't know if you can hear me or if you're even there. I don't know if you will listen to a humble prayer. To, mm-hmm. to kind of make it feel a little bit more universal for radio play, which makes complete sense. It makes complete sense in the context of what they're trying to do with that. And Bette Midler singing like, like 
a couple of those lyrics would not necessarily fit her singing it as well, well as Esmeralda said. They changed it, and I think they changed it for the for, for, for her and her singing it for the better. Um, I'm glad it's like that in the film soundtrack. But for her and herself and the lyrics that they changed, they changed for a reason. And how she sings it, I really like. And I think it fits her voice beautifully. I'm I'm actually interested to know how your opinion differs from mine, Chris. Um, this one kind of falls into what I was saying about the, the mm-hmm. Someday being, a, you know, the credit, you know, pop version or kind of a different version of a song from, um, from the film. Um, it's... You know, it's a fine song. It 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 um it has it does have the pop feel, the radio kind of feel. Um, I didn't. I just don't. It's weird how it, the earlier version of the song, because of the mess, not only the message and the music behind mm-hmm. it, how I like it, but this one, you know, it's got the same message, but it just really doesn't connect with me as much. Oh, I, I could totally why. see that. It's just um. It just feels so. It just it just has kind of a different sound from from the from the movie from the movie version, and I know a lot of those do, but uh, that for for me it's just kind of like a, it's it's just another time they've done a another version of a song from the movie. It 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 might not seem as special to you, and I completely see that. I like the added verses that they added for her as well. Mm-hmm. I think I I wish that we had the original voice actress singing an extended version of this song. Um, I, I think that was a missed opportunity. I really do. Um, but overall, I think that this is one of the stronger celebrity versions of a single. All right, Chris, going into the last part of the show is going through our favorite three songs and our least favorite three songs. So, Chris, I'm going to go to you. What are your least favorite three songs? Uh, my least favorite three would be, you know, The Guy Like You. Um mm-hmm. Someday, which I gave, I think I gave that a one timer, and then the Bette Midler um, would be down there as well for the God Help the Outcast would also be a um, a one timer for me. Who cool. my my uh, my least favorites are my least favorite is Guy Like You, then Someday by the the band All for One just doesn't gel with me, and then Topsy Turvy. I actually don't really dig that song as much as most people do, and I'm in a minority. I understand. But we're going to go into our top three favorites. For me, my top three are Hellfire at number three, God Help the Outcasts at number two, and the opening number, Bells of Notre Dame at number one. This is going to get interesting. Chris, what are your three favorites? <laughs> those are those are my three as well. The exact order. Hellfire at three, God Help the Outcast at two, and Bells of Notre Dame at one. So we, we are identical there on the top. Cause That's those not are, a lie. Yeah. Yeah, those mm-hmm. are great. Yeah, no, those are the three favorite songs. And I think, um, objectively speaking, those three are the ones that come up the most. And when we say Hellfire, we also mean Heaven's Light, because Heaven's Light is the prelude to Hellfire. So, And our overall rating on this Suddenly Soundtracks episode for 1996's Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame is rocking. And that does it for our episode of Suddenly Soundtracks, going through Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I want to thank my guests once again, Chris uh, Skaliski. Chris, what are your final thoughts on Hunchback of Notre Dame? Well, first of all, I want to thank, thank you, Chris, for having me on the show. It's been a lot of fun talking with you about this film and their soundtracks, excuse me. But um, overall thoughts is the truly kind of underrated um, Disney film and soundtrack. Oh, it has you know some of the well-known songs like Hellfire, but some some of the others like we talked Bells of Notre Dame out there, um, the Court of Miracles. There's some really good stuff in the soundtrack that 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 elevates the film for me and makes it one of those kind of um, underrated gems of of the of the Disney catalog. Indeed. And I, I myself, I've loved this this movie since I was a kid. It's one of my favorite musicals of all time and my favorite Disney musical ever. So I'm so glad that Chris brought this to my attention to bring up because I like having people who like like musicals on, on my show and have a particular fondness for a musical. I put them over myself. In this instance, I'm glad that a Hunchback came up so early early on and I'm, I'm thankful for you, Chris, for bringing it on, on to me. So... Without further ado, Chris, where can the good people find you online, my man? 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Schlick51. I'm always tweeting about movies, TV shows, Cardinal Baseball. I love Cardinal Baseball, so I tweet about that, especially with the season starting. Um, and, of course, on the Movie Trivia Schmodown Facebook page, commenting on there, posting on there. Um, so, yeah, that's where you can find me. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at ChrisClark8788. Those numbers mean nothing. Uh, you can also find me here every Wednesday hosting the show, Suddenly Soundtracks. Check out next week's episode, Newsies, featuring Robert Parker and Aaliyah Moore from All the Belts and Nerd Build. It's going to be fantastic. Anyway, from Chris and myself, you're getting Chris squared right here, ladies and gentlemen. So keep rocking and take care.